Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, week's uh, colloquium of the C3.ai Digital Transformation Institute. Um, Larry, next slide, please. Um, the institute is a new institute. It's about a year old. Its, uh, its mission is to build a coalition of leading scientists from around the world to work on a, uh, the science and technology of digital transformation, which is an area which lies at the intersection of IoT, AI, machine learning, and of course, digital, uh, of course analytics, data analytics. And uh, uh, okay, let me tell you a little bit more about the Institute. It's a partnership led by Berkeley and Illinois and includes uh, CMU, the Royal Institute of Technology, Stockholm, MIT, Princeton, Stanford, and the University of Chicago, and the Berkeley Labs, as well as the National Center for Superconducting Applications, primarily funded by C3.ai and Microsoft. And industrial members currently include AstraZeneca, Baker Hughes, and Shell. Next slide, please. Uh, just to uh, plug the... Uh, uh, the colloquium, the talks, the, the next few colloquium talks, uh, Shakotai on uh, next Thursday, talking about resource allocation from 5G to 6G. Wei Liu talking about uh, the built environment and how do you, it's all sort of a hot topic about how do you have HVAC systems to uh, deal with the pandemic as well as energy efficiency. and. Kaiyu Guan talking about uh, quantifying carbon credit. As you know, farmers in the Midwest and in other places are especially concerned about knowing how they can be reimbursed for doing sequestration. Okay, so those are upcoming talks. And as you know, we also have workshops. The next workshop uh, hosted by Costa Spanos, our co-chief co scientist with Tandy, uh, Tandy Warno, is on digital transformation of the built environment which uh, certainly works on how do you do energy efficiency as well as safe interiors of buildings. That's October 26th and 28th. Uh, the, these workshops are all on YouTube, on the C3.ai YouTube channel. Uh, past talks are also repository there, so we invite you to go to this. Next. Uh, the format of the talk, uh, Professor Doyle has requested that uh, you hold your questions to the end, use the Q&A feature to ask questions, upvote them. Uh, Larry and I will uh, do our best, okay, to moderate them. Thank you for moving it along so we can start to John. A wonderful talk, you, uh, uh, you know, John's a fantastic speaker. I've known him for years and years, and so I'm sure you will be thrilled to listen to his talk, Universal Laws and Architecture and Their Fragilities. And I have a, an introduction for him, he is, uh, he has degrees from MIT, BS, MS, and a PhD in math from Berkeley. And he's been at Caltech since. Uh, you know, this, uh, his formal biography is here. I have to say that uh, John, I first met John when I was a graduate student, and he hired me to be his research intern. The very first summer I was a graduate student, a really memorable year, a memorable summer, and uh, really impressed upon me you know, his really his joy of research. And he has been talking about uh, highly optimized tolerance and the brittleness of societal systems with all this tolerance really uh, for some years now. And I'm sure you're in for a treat. And so without further ado, uh, I will turn this over to John. John, thank you. And it's a pleasure to have you. Okay, can you see my screen? Not yet. What's going on? Okay. Hmm. Let me see. I'll try again. Oh, wait, wait. I, maybe I need to stop sharing, or is that true? No. You need to stop sharing. Yeah. Oh, and Larry, I'm sorry. Not... Larry, you need to stop sharing. Yeah, I stopped sharing. Okay. Uh... What is. I started screen sharing. There you go. Can you see that okay? Yep. Okay. So I'm, 
I am also going to talk about digital transformation in a hopefully slightly bigger context and talk about architectures. Um, oh, you want to start my video? Okay, I'll start my video. Oh, that wasn't good. Okay. Okay, so you can still, okay, fine. So you can still see me, you can still share, see, see the share and everything? Okay. Uh, so we're not seeing your slides in presentation mode there, John. I'm gonna, uh, I, I, I'm gonna st stop my video because I think something's not working. Let's just go with this. Is this okay? Uh, you're not in uh, slideshow mode. You're in, uh, you know, you're in the. What? Oh man. You know, when you're when you're doing screen share, you you have to just you, you enable share movies. That's. Is this uh, okay? Yeah. Yep. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. So I'm going to talk about architecture, um, and. It's going to be all over the map, and I apologize for the poor organization. Uh, hopefully, the ideas will be interesting, and there's stuff to follow up on. So, a, a thing that we all know really well, and I'll run through quickly, is that we're doing this Zoom uh, virtually, right? What do we mean by that? Well, um, we have we have this networked apps, and we can swap the apps. That's one of the nice things about this architecture. Um, and what do you mean by virtual? Well, it means that the apps aren't actually connected to each other. As you know, they're connected to their operating systems. Um, and so uh, the connections that we think of between Zooms, there's a really going by, by the lower, lower level, levels of the architecture. And then of course that's sitting on top of hardware. So none of the stuff up top is actually physically connected. And of course, everybody knows this and we take this for granted. So this is virtual and the, the physical hardware is real. And that's what I mean by virtualized. And what I'm gonna argue is this is all over the place. It's been here for billions of years um, and uh, we're doing a poor job of this. Um, so we got the physical stuff, which we see, uh, the apps that we see, and what we don't really see is the operating systems. And, uh, and so I'm gonna call this virtual and layered. And again, I'm gonna go through this quickly because this audience knows this probably better than I do. Um, but also when the human gets involved, it's also mostly virtual and mostly automatic and unconscious. Um, our conscious thought is tiny. Um, so we've got this, this system. And what's interesting about this system is what, what the internet people call an hourglass. And I'm gonna call it a diversity hourglass. So what that means is that if we look across all of our machines and our cell phones and everything right now, we'd find we have very diverse applications running and they're all swappable. So if I have one that you'd like, I just can give it to you and, and it'll work. The hardware is a little less diverse and a little less swappable, but still quite diverse and swappable. And the operating system is not diverse at all. So we're running all these shared architectures, all these shared protocols in the middle. Okay. So what I wanna talk about is this idea of a law, which is and I'm going to simplify it. It's speed versus accuracy, although it's you know robustness versus efficiency. There's a whole bunch of trade-off spaces. The reason I'm going to look at two dimensions is because that that's what fits on a screen. So we can think of this this uh, layered architecture as having trade-offs. So the fastest stuff is hardware, but the most flexibility is given by the software. And by combining them in just the right way, we we get what we're going to. Ideally, you just like to be fast, accurate, flexible. But none of the parts do that. So you have to build an architecture that does. And so, uh, so we have this diverse and fairly swappable hardware. We have incredibly diverse and swappable software. It's all virtualized. Um, and then the OS sits between. And what I'm gonna call this is a diversity enabled sweet spot. We have these diverse pieces and the same would be true of the building you're sitting in. Or the same would be true of your, as you'll see your brain, your cells, everything. Um, and what we do is we have parts that don't do what we want. And so we combine them in clever ways through architecture to create what I'm calling a diversity enabled sweet spot. The diversity by itself does nothing, it just sits there. But it enables you to, with the right architecture, create these sweet spots. So what ends up happening is we have systems that are fast, cheap, accurate, flexible, even though none of the parts are. Um, so, uh, and so I'm gonna just call that a SAT, SAT, speed actually trade-offs. And there's Lots of other dimensions here. I'm gonna focus on these uh, and accuracy and flexibility tend to go here together, but the true space 
of trade-offs is enormous. And so I'm, I'm simplifying it because it's easy to understand it and draw pictures. Okay, so, and so these are the kind of new ideas I want you to think about. Diverse enables to be spots, speed actually trade-offs, uh, virtualization, and so on, and architecture. So let's give it another example. So this, the one on the left is decades old. The one on the right is billions of years old. And what we have there is we have, as we know, genes, which uh, we're still using. Um, and they're also network swappable and very diverse across the bacterial uh, biosphere. Um, and so again, the idea is that those diverse genes are swappable by horizontal gene transfer. Um, there's enormous diversity in the metabolites. Those are also swappable. So in a, in a, uh, in the, in the, in the ecosystems that the bacteria live in, they're constantly swapping metabolites. Um, what's not swappable and not diverse is the, their operating system, which is roughly transcription and translation. Um, and that's both universal across all of biology and you don't swap it. So if you wanna figure out lineages, you can't look at any protein because they'll just be, who knows where it came from. But the, the operating system lineages are very fixed. And so you can make lineages out of even bacteria that go back billions of years. Um, now it's possible to build hardware only biology and here's some examples, but they're all situations where in order to specialize and be super fast and efficient, for example, in your red blood cells, you jettison all of this higher level, arc, uh, a higher layer architecture and, um, and run just the protein layer. And we do that too. You know, so we have a lot of specialized hardware that doesn't have all the other stuff, but it has to be built by the other stuff. So there isn't anything like this that just stands alone. Um, so again, if you want speed and efficiency in control, then you have to do it in proteins, but your most flexibility is in genes. And so in bacteria, horizontal gene transfer in humans and you carry out sexual recombination, we can do selective breeding and we can even now do genetic engineering. So we can do swapping those genes ourselves in synthetic biology. Now, a consequence of that is that it's really easy for bacteria to get antibiotic resistance because they don't have to evolve it on their own. They can just get it from their buddies. That's really bad for us. But also viruses and phage can hijack this. So it's a universal architecture. There's phages that go in and take over these cells. And uh, depending on how you do the statistics, arguably um, phages are the dominant life form on, on the planet, actually by quite a bit. Um, so we have these two examples now, invo both involving horizontal transfer, both involving diverse diversity hourglasses, um, both evol involving extremely non-diverse shared operating systems and then diverse hardware. So one is decades old, the others is billions of years old. And in both cases, it's all virtualized. So if you do genetic engineering, you have to worry a bit about what's going on in the operating system, but you often just swap stuff in and it works. So it does all of these things. Um, let's take another example that's more on maybe a million years old to get something in between. We could make, I could spend, I could spend the whole day going through hundreds of examples. So we're gonna take another one that's different enough that it'll be, I hope, stretch your thinking here. So let's just think about language. Language is layered. We swap memes. We do that by a shared uh, operating system on top of hardware that's evolved to some extent to facilitate language. Um, so very diverse memes, um, not so diverse sounds, not at all diverse grammar. So if we can't, we don't have a shared grammar, we can't talk to each other. Um, so, we, so right now we're swapping memes. So I'm giving you these ideas, mostly stuff that you've heard about. Um, and so the idea is that language has a layered architecture and again, you probably remember from school that you can you know, look in detail at the architecture. But of course, right now you're running all that, but it's virtualized unconscious and automatic. Once you learn it, you don't need to uh, consciously think about grammar. So again, we have these three systems, billions of years old, million years old, decades old, all with what I'm gonna argue is a shared architecture. Now these systems are way more different than they are similar. So more or less all they have in common is this picture, but it has all these features. Um, and it greatly accelerates evolvability because you don't have to evolve these things on your own. You can swap all the, any innovations that occur in any place can be swapped. Um, and so 
any bacteria that evolves a new gene can swap it with all their, uh, their not even the same species. They can go across species. Anybody who comes up with a new idea can share it. Anybody who makes a new app can share it. But also, these things, we could go on about this, but between language and uh, digital, uh, the, what you guys call digital transformation, it's affecting everything. And so, and all of these are digital transformations. And we could, again, we could find a hundred more. We could talk about eukaryotes and the transition to eukaryotes. We could talk about the transition to bipedalism. We could talk about, you know, all sorts of things. Um, this is evolution. It's not intelligent design. I think intelligent design is a great idea in engineering, uh, not in biology. Um, but none of this was done by intelligent design. It all evolved by trial and error. Um, now, obviously, well, if you, again, if you believe in evolution, you're gonna say, yeah, okay, that's true about the genes and the bacteria, but what about the others? Uh, the others too. So let me say, let me just summarize what we mean by architecture here now. And let's use software and hardware as an example. Um, the idea is that there's laws. You can't, you'd like to have just fast and accurate and flexible but you don't have a single part that does that. And so you're kind of stuck with this. So what you do is you build all the stuff you can. Again, you can think about the building you're in. There's a huge diversity of parts that the building is made out of. And then what you do is you combine them in such a way that all that's virtualized, so you don't see those details and you get a fast, accurate and flexible system. And the point is the virtualization creates this sweet spot out of this diverse uh, components. And you need an OS of some kind. Um, and again, this is evolution. It's not intelligent design. And what I mean by that, let's take it this picture. What, what I mean by this, this, this is intelligent design. So people are designing these things all the time and plugging them in. Uh, new hardware, new apps, you know, fantastic. Not so much on the operating system, but, but the hardware and apps. There's, there is very sophisticated, very intelligent design being done of this. That's evolution. We stumbled into this. And you can study the history of the internet to understand how much of this was an accident. Um, it doesn't mean it's stupid. Uh, bacterial architecture is astonishing. Of the three architectures that I've showed you, bacteria are the superior one by far. I mean, they evolved into us kind of as a joke. So, um, so evolution is very powerful, but it also has its downsides. Now, I guess for this group, I should probably draw this picture, not the simple one I just drew, but um, you guys can fill that in. You know that more better than I do. So let me give you a recent paper that uh, goes through these ideas very concretely with lots of data, lots of theory, and all reproducible by high school students. So here's the idea, mountain biking down a, a, a bumpy twisting trail. How do we do that? Again, roughly speaking, we split it into two layers. We have a visual layer called, I'll call it trails, that, that looks ahead and sees where the trail is and steers to stay on the trail. And then there is a much more reflex layer that deals with the bumps. And these are separate parts of your brain, they're separate parts. And, and so, um, and they have a whole bunch of features. And I'm, again, projecting down into two dimensions. Ideally, you would just like, you just, you know, build a robot that does this and build it out of really fast electronics and it would be fast, accurate, flexible and all things, but you can't do that. So you're stuck. You can't get in that ideal corner. So what we did is we made a, a really simple video game that had trails and bumps. The bumps are created by a motor in this, in the, in the uh, steering wheel. And we have a theory that fits it. And I'm gonna go through this really quickly because it's now been published and hopefully all I'll do is get you to go read the paper. But the idea is that we can beat this to death because it's all virtual. We can, we can explore uh, regimes of the experiment that would be impossible to do in, or, or dangerous to do in real biking. So in fact, this is actually in some ways better than real biking. Um, and turns out all of this can be uh, reproduced by high school students. Now, admittedly, the high school students that did that are quite sophisticated. But the hope is that if it is, now the scientific community is going to hate this because it's a whole bunch of theory they've never heard of before and rejects all of the things that they think they know. So the idea is that if, they're, if, if, they're, if their children can learn it, maybe they, they can teach it to their parents. So what are the components here? We have vision, we have a muscle spindle, we have muscles and those, and those are the components. 
So what the challenge is, is we don't really know how the control system works here. I mean, the H and the L are our cortex, are in cortex. Components unevenly known, some architectures known, but we do have some constraints. So what we do is we impose the known constraints and then we optimize everything we don't know. And now, um, so we put speed accuracy trade-offs on the, on the sensors and actuators. And it turns out the way we've done the experiments, we can massively modify those to explore a, a, a wide space of alternatives that we couldn't do otherwise. Um, and then we optimize it. Now, what we do is we get the absolute best uh, system as constrained by the, the speed accuracy trade-offs. So they're severely constrained, but we're then gonna optimize everything else. Um, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna assume that the trail and the bumps are worst case. Um, because again, we, we, if you, you don't care if you stay on, on the trail on average, you care that you don't go off the cliff. So it really is a natural worst case setting. Um, and so, and you can do this. And it turns out for this problem, uh, and these experiments, you can do this with basically high school calculus. And the data fits the theory to an extraordinary degree. Um, and so the problem with this is none of the scales to real biology. And that's where you need this new thing called system level synthesis. Um, again, I could have given the whole hour talk on that. There's probably people in the audience that understand that better than I do. I'll say a little bit about it later. So this paper, does all this um, and it has diversity enabled sweet spots, it has layered architectures. So these are the concepts that are essential to understand this and I claim are essential no matter what. So the nature of the trade-offs will change and sensory motor control will change, but diversity enabled sweet spots and layered architectures are essential to understand uh, architecture. And then the question is, where do these biologically plausible constraints come from? Well, here's where levels come in. We have this, we've talked about the system level of trails and bumps, but we actually have a nerve level. And it turns out this case is really easy because the, the, the accurate layer above is implemented in accurate nerves and the fast layer above the reflexes are implemented in fast nerves. And nerves then have the same sort of speed accuracy trade-off. So, where this really comes from is the nerves out of which we're building this control system have severe trade-offs. They, they are highly local and they have really rough delays and bandwidth limits. So really severe trade-offs that we do not have in electronics. So this is a different world and all of our control theory breaks here. Um, fortunately, we have a fix for that. So the idea is that we have trade-offs, we have diverse enabled sweet spots, we have layers and levels. And I claim that that is universal across everything we're, gonna, we're, we're interested in. And here, evolution is roughly intelligent design by putting design in quotes, which is if we were to redesign the system with this hardware, with these, uh, with these objectives, we would come up with apparently what evolution has produced. That won't always be the case. Sometimes we can do better. Sometimes it'll be hard to do as well. Um, here's an old example, decade old, of essentially the same set of ideas, which is now the trade-offs are robustness and efficiency. The problem is metabolic control, but you still have diverse enabled sweet spots, layered architectures. Um, now, the problem with papers like this, it did, it did get into a good journal. It's virtually impossible to publish this. You have to get really lucky because, you're so because the experimentalists love it but all the resident theorists hate it because it's all ideas that they have never thought of before and think are insane. So I, the reviews are crazy. Uh, and so we got really lucky. We got a brilliant editor who could see through hopefully the, the um, quite negative reviews. Um, so, so to scale to real biology, you really need this thing called system level synthesis. And let me try to say a little bit about that. I, I don't have, to, I mean, again, um, you in, your, in the audience or certainly in your universities, there are now plenty of people who know this better than I do. It's really, in the, it's a few years ago, it was exclusively my group. It's now spread partly because my students are all over the place, but okay. So this is kind of a weird picture. What I wanna do is this is, um, this is what's going on in that box, but I have to flip it around because I want the arrows to go in the same direction. So 
what this is, is this is zooming in on that, those boxes. So in, in our theory, those are just simple scalar transfer functions um, or operators. Very, very simple. That's, of course, that's not what's happening to the brain. What's happening to the brain is this thing on the left. And so what, what's interesting about it is the forward path that we think of as being in the feedback loop is simple and fast. And you want it to be fast because delay is death in, in a situation like mountain biking. But the actual feedbacks around that going the opposite direction are much more complex. Um, they have much more complex receptors, memory, more wires, everything about it is more complex, which is, has been bewildering because why do you have so much complexity in the wires going the opposite way of the control system? And it turns out this is universal. We can look at Drosophila, same thing. We can look at even bacterial chemotaxis. We can look at the immune system. And you see this over and over and over again. Um, and there are a thousand explanations for this and they're all mostly wrong. Um, the idea that this is predictive, if you might heard of predictive coding, that's roughly right. Or if you've heard that it was Bayes, that's roughly right. But Bayes doesn't worry about time. Bayes doesn't worry about delay. And so, if you take away delay and do Bayes here, you don't need any of this stuff. So here's a paper. Um, it just got submitted to uh, ACC, but there's an archive journal, uh, archive version, which I hope you'll take a look at. Um, uh, four of our co-authors are, you know, sort of serious experimental neuroscientists. So uh, they they're on board with this and. The problem is you can't really study this in the detail we'd like to in primates because you can't do, certainly not humans, but even primates, you can't do the kind of invasive things you'd like to do. Fortunately, Drosophila have more or less the same architecture. So we can, we can now pursue this in Drosophila and no one's tried to look at it this way at all. Um, and so here's what I'm, I won't, Maybe if we have some time at the end, I'll go through this. But let me just tell you, this is an example. This is just a toy example of this paper um, by Lisa Lee, who's a, a graduate student at Caltech. She also wrote this paper to go and submit it to ACC and it's available on archive. So the idea is that we, we, she just made up a, a simple problem in which it was a linear quadratic state feedback problem. And if you did it that way, you'd get a U equals KX, K is a constant. With SLS, what you're allowed to do is impose internal limits on sparsity and delay of the communication network. And if you know Witzenhausen, all the work since, you know that that's a complete nightmare. Well, no longer. So here's the idea is the communication network in the SLS case, it's the same problem, but the communication network is now highly constrained. It's delayed, it's very sparse. So in the LQSF case, all these boxes would be just a, just a game that would no dynamics. And what we have is this huge memory. So what happens is the computation actually, it turns out that the computation involved is much less with SLS, but the memory is huge. And we think that's actually how biology works. And so we've got to go check that now. Okay, so we have these ideas. You'd ask, what about the immune system? And again, I don't have time to go through this, but the idea is that the immune system is layered. In this case, we're including not only what's in our bodies, but what's in our behavior and what's in policy and clinical interventions. Um, and the idea is that, what's the diversity enabled sweet spot here? Well, it turns out things like vir uh, vaccines are, are exactly this. So when we, we, what we do is we get, a, uh, we, we get to accelerate a otherwise slow but accurate adaptive immune system. And to go after this, of course, you need all the same laws, layers, levels, all the constraints, everything. Uh, and you need SLS, of course. And now you have a bunch of levels because you got population levels, you got host levels, you got cell levels, and you got virus levels. So the levels really go up, the, the layers go way up. And so it's a, it's a complicated problem, but this stuff uh, seems to apply. So here's the big thing. What can go wrong, okay? So that's just sort of the warm up because what I'm really interested in is what can go wrong because things are going wrong and they're gonna get worse. And almost everything we're doing now in sort of digital transformation is making, is going to make things worse. So we need to understand not anecdotally what goes wrong here. We have to understand fundamentally what goes wrong here. And so I'm going to be really superficial here and just do sort of 
the most obvious things that you all totally know about, right? So this does this. Um, and it, it's really amazing how this enables evolvability, flexibility, and learning. And again, also, if you want to look at how learning and SLS interact, again, you've got experts in your universities now who are probably doing that. Um, but it does all these amazing things. But this universality is exploited by viruses in both situations. So we, we, we know there's viruses that uh, attack uh, bacteria. It turns out experts say that um, most of life is bacterial and, and lives in the ocean. And half of it is killed every day by viruses, half. Now who picks half? Turns out the viruses pick half because if they kill more, they kill all their hosts and their hosts all die out. So um, that's when I say uh, viruses rule this planet. We'd like them not to. Now, predators don't care about architecture. They just want the meat so they can destroy it. But viruses really hijack the architecture. And these are all examples of pathogens. We got a new one, right? So we had a, a new interesting one this, this last couple of years. We also got malware, which is so diverse, I can't even list it here. Um, social media has become, I think, our favorite malware. Um, now there's an interesting thing called zombie parasites. These are parasites that not only hijack like viruses to reproduce, they actually, uh, hijack very complex behaviors. And the upper right-hand corner is a fascinating one where it's a, there's, a, there's a pathogen that makes mice unafraid of cats so that they can complete their life cycle by going through the, the cat. Anyway, um, but in science fiction, we have zombies, right? We, so a good example of this is, is rabies. So rabies is a virus, but it, it hijacks the the predatory aspects of its host to propagate. Fortunately, rabies currently does not uh, go between humans. If it did, we would be done for. Um, so in the immune system, you've got the layers. And again, like I said, uh, and so one of the things you can look at is how the diversity and evolution of the virus interacts with the immune system. So um, I think we, we, we to study these problems, you really, really need the machine where I'm talking about, and it's completely new to this community. So we're trying to see if we can uh, get people up to speed on all this. Okay, so um, what else can go wrong? Well, one of the things that I think has been interesting about, interesting is a bad word, awful, <laughs> about what this has revealed is um, how it's amplified what I'm gonna call systemic race and, and wealth inequality in particular. And we all talk about this, but we don't do anything about it. Um, and of course there's all sorts of stuff going wrong, right? Um, and so I wanna think about how does the architectures here contribute to this? And so we've talked about uh, language importantly, and it turns out language is also hijackable, right? We just have, we can have bad memes, right? So the idea is that just like viruses hijack this easy transfer, we can do bad meme transfer. Um, and we're doing that massively, right? So arguably the biggest problem humans now have is that they have beliefs that are false, unhealthy, and dangerous. And you're from, you can pick your favorite ones. Um, uh, so, and social media is accelerating that. So language by itself is bad enough, Language sitting on top of the architecture of social media is even worse. And again, we're doing nothing to stop this. And again, this is a sitting on top of all this malware. So we have two kinds of malware. We have bad memes and bad code. And again, all these dangerous ideas. And these ideas that we thought we might have blunted at least a bit seem to be coming back with a vengeance. And and I we I think we have a the beginnings of a nice theory of this now. Uh, don't, I'll mention this at the end. So the question is, oh, science is so great. Science protects us from this. Unfortunately not. Um, if you look at the scientific community broadly about anything in my talk, uh, they will believe things that are false, unhealthy, and dangerous, in my opinion. Of course, that's my opinion, and they will sell the opposite of me. They'll say, all this stuff about layers and diversity and stuff is crap, 
right? So, um, and that's where you, that's why this stuff is unpublishable. Though, you know, you, if you get the right teammates, you can. Okay, so in this, not at all. And so I call this thing called zombie science. And, uh, and I've actually written a lot of papers on this, particularly in physics. And, and so far the physicists hate it. And uh, so I'm not making much progress here. And it does look like we're losing this battle. Um, and there is good science. It's not that we can't do good science. It's just that good science seems not to be winning. Um, and so we'd like a robust science. Uh, we don't have it, but we could. So what else can go wrong? Well, like I said, COVID is aggravating to expose these pervasive inequalities. Where do they come from? And so what is the architecture of inequality and systemic fragility? And again, I think there's a lot of discussion of this. I think it's superficial. Um, it's a bit like thinking that the virus must somehow hate poor people. Um, the virus doesn't care. It's us that make poor people uh, vulnerable. So what's the right picture for the sort of architecture of a legal and justice system? So that's one of the things I'm gonna look at, okay? So this, the upper left-hand picture, we all pretty much understand. What's the lower left-hand picture? Well, what's the hardware? Well, the hardware is the stuff you really see in the street. So I'm gonna say it's the police and the corrections and the parole officers. Now, I'm only talking a little bit right now about, about the legal system. We'll see how that affects other things. So what's the software? Well, it's the courts and the legislature. Again, this is pretty superficial. But the idea is that that's all virtualized. So you don't see that when you hit systemic racism. Um, but I argue that seeing just the tip of the spear uh, doesn't tell you about the, the technology behind it. So the systemic racism is much more in the hidden virtualized part of the system than it is on the surface. I'm not saying the surface isn't, isn't bad. I'm not saying the virus isn't bad. I'm saying the inequality that we see in the virus is not due to the virus itself or only partly due to the virus itself. It's due to the conditions of the society that the virus ends up in. So where does, this, where does systemic racism live? And I'm not saying that there aren't racist police. I'm just saying that it goes much deeper and I wanna try this. How does this get hijacked? How does this actually get hijacked? What is zombie law? Let's look at the civil rights amendments. Fabulous. There's no question these are important, the Civil Rights Act and the Women's Rights Act. But I'm gonna claim this is all zombie law. And what do I mean by that? Well, I'm not gonna talk about the 13th Amendment. There's this great documentary on it. What I'm gonna talk about is the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment has actually been heavily used, but not for civil rights, but actually against them, which is a horrible irony. It was done with good intentions, I'm sure, but it has been almost nothing but evil since. So it's really been hijacked. So I'm gonna call this zombie law. Um, so how does this work? Well, here's the, I'm, gonna, I'm kind of out of time, so I'm gonna do this quickly. So 14th Amendment, just, this is what it says. It says, don't provide, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so go look it up if you don't know it. So how's it been used? Well, it's actually been, it, it was used to create, to underscore Jim Crow separate but equal in the Plessy in 1896. So that's one of the most crushing defeats for civil rights in, in history. But it also is used to shield excessive police violence. So all these things like qualified immunity and so on that you know about now as a consequence of last year that shield the police from, from any prosecution or even civil, that was all done using the 14th Amendment. It's also done some stuff about gun laws. So here's the idea is that you've got these three big things that are really the heart of systemic racism and they're all made out of the 14th Amendment. They were all based on the 14th Amendment. I mean, that's astonishing zombie law. So what I claim is it's this architecture that's the problem. It's not the individuals in the street. Um, it's not this virus. It's every virus is going to have this kind of effect. Um, and there's just huge fragilities that are a consequence of this. So I want to, so this is only, again, the tip of the iceberg. Um, so what is the architecture of fragility here? What I'm going to look at is this in a little more, a little more depth. So what else can go wrong? So what has the 14th Amendment most been used for? While it's not being used to protect 
police from prosecution for you know, uh, shooting young black men. Um, it's what person means. And person means corporations, not you or me. So more than 90% of the use of the 14th Amendment has been for corporations. And what has it done? Well, that's sort of what a corporation architecture looks like, or it at least does in principle. But what happens is the 14th Amendment has been used to systematically turn it into this picture. And so what ends up happening as a consequence of this is this is, this is the Dow Jones in 2020. Um, uh, there was a, more than a trillion dollars in, in wealth that was created in, in, this, in the stock market. All of it went to less than a thousand billionaires. So for everybody else, it's a zero sum game. Um, so some have suffered, some have benefited, but if you're not a billionaire, it's zero sum. Here's the stock market for you know last 40 years, a few dips, but mostly it goes up. And the point is the architecture has that as its only objective. And everything else is going to hell. And again, this is not an accident. This it, any more than the symptoms you have of the virus are an accident. They're a direct consequence of your architecture interacting with the virus. And so uh, this is just, you know, uh, again, a classic example. I chose this because chances are, roughly speaking, you're familiar with this. So these are sort of zombie corporations. And all these inequalities are due to things like this, not just this, but I've tried to highlight a few things. So I call that sort of zombie law. And it's, it's taken the 14th Amendment, which was there to give civil rights to former slaves, at least, and, and the extent to which it has been turned into a really nasty zombie law is, is, a, is even for me, astonishing. Um, so this stuff is, you gotta do these laws, but you gotta then protect them, right? And you can't let them turn into zombie law. So we sort a lot of stuff here, right? So I'm, I'm gonna sort of wrap up. Um, and uh, so, so I've very superficially talked about the theory. The big theory is the thing in the lower side, which is this uh, SLS. Um, we've got these ideas. So the question is, is there any hope? And I think there is. So there are animal societies, there's three of them in particular that really work well and we're killing them all but they really work well, the elephants, the bonobos and the orcas. So I have a theory of social architecture. They are good examples of them. They're totally different organisms, but they have a shared architecture and it really works. And if they can do it, we could do it. Um, okay, so these are my students that did sort of did the work. Um, there's tons more in my Dropbox folder, terribly organized. Um, and I think I'll stop yeah, I'm pretty much out of time. I'll stop here. If you want to hear more, go read this paper. I could tell you a little bit more about it, but um, I think this is, I'm out of time. So I could have spent the whole hour on this. This is, this is by far the most interesting thing I've ever worked on. Um, everything else felt, felt kind of incremental. Like how do you get robustness into modern control theory? Turned out that was kind of incremental. This is the least incremental thing I, I, I've ever worked on. Um, and it completely changes everything. So I'm very excited about it. Uh, but fortunately now it's really caught on um, and uh, you probably have faculty in your institutions that know this as, as well as anyone. Okay, so I'll stop there. Uh, fantastic. Uh, John, uh, you know, while we're waiting for questions to come in, do tell us a little bit more about the slide that you have about the system level synthesis. I know you didn't, have a, a, a chance to say. So tell me why. Uh, tell me why you're so excited about uh, system level synthesis. Okay. Just, just tell me a little more. A little more. Okay, I'll tell you a little more. So th th this is a toy problem that that Lisa did, and it's deliberately chosen as a problem for which, if you had no constraints on internal communications inside of your controller it would just be U equals KX, K is a constant gain matrix. So this is just a classic state feedback controller. Now, what SLS allows is you to say, no, I can't build that. Um, what I can build 
is stuff that has local interactions only. So you can only talk to neighbors and you do so with delays, which is realistic. That's, that's not how our airplanes work, but that's how biology works. So most of engineering doesn't have that problem. The electronics is so fast, you don't worry about the internal delays um, in, inside your, that'll change with cyber physical systems. Okay. So, so here what happens is now you're gonna say, okay, I'm gonna impose that my controller must be built out of the slow uh, localized hardware. And again, if you know the subject of sort of distributed decentralized control, you know that all of a sudden you're in the Witzenhausen nightmare space, right? And we've been beating our heads against this for decades and just, just had it all wrong. So the idea is that what, what we're saying here is the communication here, internal to the controller is much more restricted than the LQSF case, uh, which one would think we thought was NP hard, end of story, Actually, it turns out with SLS, the computation is vastly cheaper. It's actually order one. So no matter how big your system is, you get scalable design because you're actually taking advantage of the locality to create little patches of design. So you can just design in a neighborhood and it's, it's globally optimal. The price you pay is you go from a memoryless, static constant gain controller to, and I, this sort of a cartoon on the right, which is all those little boxes are memory units. So you have this enormous memory um, and that's the price you pay, but memory's cheap and particularly cheap in biologies. And so memory's cheap, fast communications is prohibitively expensive. So this is a trade-off that's a real win in biology. Now it's going to be a win in cyber physical systems, because all the same things are going to be true. They're not yet, but they will be. So this is the theory we need. And like I said, it's um, the, <laughs> the weird thing is, uh, the way we got this was I wrote down a very specific conjecture, which turned out to be exactly this, and said, I think this is impossible, but we need to prove that, prove that this is intractable. And the students said, came back and said, hey, wait a second, what you proposed we can do here, look. And uh, that's, what, what's, that's what this SLS is. Now, five years ago, this was you know, a dream, um, but it's really caught on. It's won every paper award that it's been eligible for. You know, now we have kind of a flood of stuff on this. So a huge backlog of, of stuff on this. And uh, now the problem is, you're gonna get a huge bifurcation because some neuroscientists say, oh my God, that's exactly how my brain or the, you know, my fly looks, right? So when you show this in detail to neuroscience they are capable of understanding it, they go, wow, for the first time, this looks like what I think is going on. Um, but all the theoreticians go, no way. Like what's this? Why are you so worried about delay? What's the big deal about delay? We're saying, look, if you're doing control, delay is death, but you've got slow hardware. So how do you build robust control systems out of slow hardware? And in engineering, you say, oh, don't, don't try that. It's not gonna work, but here you have to. And so you get these systems. So that was probably more of a longer answer than you wanted, but, um, but I think the, the literature out there is accessible. And again, now, like I said, you probably got you probably got a professor at your university who's as expert on this now as, as I am. Although this is brand new, this picture is really new. So the connections with neuroscience of this type is new. And in those papers that we submitted to ACC, um, but there'll be longer archive versions with more details. And so this has been very vetted by real experts in neuroscience. But the problem is we don't really know what those red arrows are doing in the brain. Um, and we know a little bit more about what they're doing in flies. And so we think in flies, we can, we can figure out what they're doing and then eventually figure out what they're doing. But by the way, there is a, an enormous amount of existing experimental literature that has just been mystery. And it's all consistent with this, particularly Ann Churchland's work, recent work uh, is spot on connected to this. It, so everything she says about what the red wires are doing is consistent with what SLS says the red wires have to do. Great. Uh, it, it is true that we have a SLS expert here at Berkeley, and we certainly benefit from 
talking with him. Uh, let me oh, the you. other thing is there's a big, so again, this is the part that I'm totally not an expert on and I'm, I'm actually deliberately ignoring because the people working on it are way smarter than I am. But um, it turns out if you want to slap, so here's what's gonna happen no matter what. All the architectures that I'm talking about, somebody is gonna slap machine learning on top of it. And how do we prevent that from being like the end of the world? And I don't mean the end of the world because they take over. I mean the end of the world because we wake up one morning and we're in the stone age and we can't turn anything on. Um, I, I can imagine that there's a threat because this stuff might take over. I'm just afraid that it'll, it'll work great for a few years and then not work at all. And we can't reboot, you know, we keep rebooting and nothing happens and we're in the stone age or worse. Um, the experts tell me that the best way to combine AI with control is with SLS, but I, I am deliberately not an expert on that because the people that are saying that are, are a lot smarter than I am and I'm happy to have them carry that ball. So what I'm gonna worry about is what goes in the intermediate layers. And I'm gonna take for granted that they're gonna put ML on whatever I do. Uh, okay, uh, you know, I'm still waiting for uh, people to put in questions, but I'm, you know, in your last slide, you talked about Bonobos, Elephants and Orcas. And what, what is your, what, what, uh, so it was really intriguing. So you said those are three societies that have actually figured this out. And, and so what, what, uh, what, what do you think, uh, I mean, what, what, what do they, they have, uh, have they done it through different routes or what, what, what is your? Well, first of all, this is at least as complicated as explaining to you how the internet works, okay? So um, if you have no idea how the internet works and I start telling you about TCP IP packets, you know, mm -hmm. uh, it's bewildering, okay. Um, and I don't understand this as well as I should, but I've been working pretty hard on it lately. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, I can give you the I can give you the the dangerous answer. So I'll give you an answer that will get me crucified on social media. So hopefully, keep this to yourselves. Mm -hmm. Now this is a consequence. But a feature of all three societies is males have no political role whatsoever, nothing. All decisions involving large groups or long range decisions are made by postmenopausal females. So grannies, grannies run these societies. They don't, they don't fight to get there. Nobody wants to be the leader, but the leaders are all, uh, and, and now that's a consequence. I'm, I'm claiming that's a consequence. Now you might say, oh, you want matriarchies. Well, actually, no, you don't want, you don't want, I mean, you do, yes, but matriarchies is necessary, but not sufficient. So there are matriarchies, there are societies that are matriarchal that are vicious and homicidal and war, have war. But these don't have wars, they don't have bullying, they don't have infanticide, they don't have cannibalism. Now the orcas are the top predators in the ocean. So they're violent, they're very violent. Um, but, but there's no warfare and there's no homicide. And so, uh, and of course, and, and uh, elephants are extremely violent. Um, but again, uh, they don't hurt their babies. They don't hurt the matri matriarchs. They don't hurt the females. Um, and the females run the show. Now the males roles in these societies are completely different from each other. Um, and so all those, all the other details are completely different, but there's a core thing. And the core thing is you build on the relationship between mother and child. That bond, you build an architecture, a societal architecture out of that by scaling that up. And you ask, how do you scale it? Well, that's, that's what you need a theory for. But these all have scaled it modestly. Um, and um, it's hard to build empires out of that because you need, you obviously need standing armies and stuff. So, so you'd have standing armies and those would be all male. Um, and that works in this setting because they're small. Um, and the males seem to have no inclination to take over. So that's one of the differences with humans is the males are very happy in their role. So the males in these societies are much happy. So chimps, uh, male bonobos 
live a blissful life compared to the nasty world that the chimps live in. And they're basically the same organisms. They just have different, they just have different social architectures. Genetically, they're basically the same. Um, so the one that I put in here in the little corner is the baboons. And so the baboons are the most, there's a story about baboons that's the most encouraging scientific fact I've ever learned. Um, but it's a long story, but uh, I, I've got some videos on it and stuff. So, but you can look this up, look up Sapolsky and, and baboons and you'll, you'll find about this, it's, it's fantastic. So, um, but if they can do it, if these societies can do it, humans can do it, but we obviously, as a first cut, we just have to stop electing um, men to political office. Um, and in the long run, I think we don't need to do that. I think that's a, I think in the long run, once we shift things towards uh, a really healthy society, then you know men can participate if they want. It's just that in the short run, what we're doing doesn't work. And it's again, all of this is aggravated by weapons. It's aggravated by technology. So all the digital technology we're building is making all this worse, not better. Um, the problem is what I just told you is you know politically insane. So the left hates you because you say men and women aren't the same. And the right hates you because you said, you know, I don't think men should run things. So everybody hates you if you have this position. But these societies are beautiful and they're going extinct because we're killing them all. Fantastic. This, uh, you know, I, I don't want to hog any more of these uh, Shrikant and others. Let me make sure you get some airtime. But uh, really a thought-provoking talk, as Tandy has said in the uh, in the chat. Uh, Shrikant, it looks like you're ready to jump yeah, in. Yeah, I just have a I just have a quick question for John. So, uh, in the context of the internet, John, I guess you know. I mean, yeah. Not that you know, you know very know it very well. Uh, uh, like the results initiated by Glenn Minicom, for example, on uh, when there is delay, just you have a very very simple scheme to uh, make the system stable. Uh, so I was just wondering, there also you achieve some optimization objectives such as maximizing network utility or something yep, like yep. that. So in SLS, is the difference because the objective is sort of uh, uh, more over a time interval? I mean, so basically. You're trying to solve a static problem there. So is the is the difference in SLS the, the 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 issue with delays? What I'm saying is that I guess in the internet case, we know that we can handle delays with very, very simple, a simple rule, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, that's a that's a great question. Yeah. So um, um, <laughs> I, I quit working on the internet mostly because Stephen Lowe did. Um, but also because with, with SDN now, I mean, TCP was really just a bad architecture. With SDN, you basically have full state feedback and you can control everything and there's no penalty for dropping packets. So it's as if you had a control system where your B matrix and your C matrix are the identity and your A matrix is sparse. So what do you do? I mean, this is, I'm oversimplifying it, but in the SLS context, what you do is you just cancel the A matrix. I mean, B and C is the identity. So you make the control as U equals minus AX and you now have deadbeat control instantly globally. Um, and that's really boring. And SLS doesn't do anything differently. Um, the problem with, if you're controlling not the internet but trolling something uh, with the internet, um, and this, this is unlikely as well, but you could, get, you could get in a situation where you're trying to do IOT on top of something like the power grid, where the delays inside the internet were, were actually hurting you with respect to control. Um, that's very different than controlling the packets. It's, you're using packets to control power in the grid. Um, now, the way the brain works is, the, the, the internet, the IOT part of that system is really slow. It's really cheap too. It's, it's, it doesn't use much energy, but it's really slow. So a lot of times the physical system you're controlling is actually happening faster than your brain, the hardware in your brain can keep up with. And so that's the opposite of the internet. Um, and you can't just drop a packet here and there because if you do, you die. 
So, uh, so SLS, I don't think is gonna make any difference to the internet. And it may not make any difference to IoT until, until the delays associated with trying to do it with cheap hardware, like the brain, uh, and the localization. So you can only talk to neighbors. Um, you can't do this kind of, I mean, look at how fast we're talking to each other across the whole world right now. Um, that's very special and controlling that is trivial. But if that gets slower and you put it on top of a physical system that's comparably fast, then nothing up until SLS will help you. And so it's really the relative delay that, and it's not just relative delay, it's sparsity, it's saturation, it's quantization, it's all the things that limit the hardware in biology and neuroscience that never have in engineering. And they will. Um, so, uh, but I'm actually, that's not my big worry here. I mean, I think when we get to those kinds of problems, it won't be hard to get engineers to use these methods. Um, I'm now concerned with all the other things I talked about, about pandemics, about the end of democracy, um, you know, just all the catastrophes that are, you know, global warming. Um, and all this virtualized architecture makes it so that we can just you know, plug into the wall and we have no consequences. We flush our toilets, no consequences. We never see anything. So one of the, I didn't talk about this very much, but, but all of our architectures that we are now in virtualize away all the problems that we're causing by using them. We, so we've got to figure out a way around that. Um, so the digital transformations, and I could have listed a hundred, have all been astonishing in what they're capable of, but also nightmares in which in what the side effects that they allow to develop. And we've got to stop evolving those architectures because we never can get out ahead of the fragilities they create. We've got to start doing intelligent design. Um, and we do intelligent design of our chips and we do intelligent design of our routers and we do intelligent design of our application software. And Zoom is obviously intelligently designed but the architectures were always just evolving and ad hoc, informal. And the people who are good at that are billionaires, right? So you invent a new architecture, search, you know, social media, those kinds of architectures, Amazon, those are all new platforms, new architectures, ad hoc in their design, but winner take all, in how they completely overtake things. We've got to stop evolving those things. We've got to start designing them systematically. And, and, and the reason we got off into SLS was the first thing you see is if you're gonna do all this systematically in, in neuroscience or societies or future cyber physical systems, existing control theory just doesn't, just doesn't work. But the good news about SLS is that almost everything you had before ports over, you know, MPC, you know, saturation compensation, you know, everything you ever did, uh, you just do in this new context. And so it's a little like robust control ended up being, you know, you still use Riccati equations, you still use, you know, LMIs, you still do convex optimization when you can, uh, you still use state space, right? So here you can't use state space anymore. You need a new object. So anyway, I'm, go I'm, I'm, <laughs> way, I'm way over time, sorry, but I'm, I'm, I'm happy to stay and answer questions, so. Thank you, John. Fantastic. Uh, uh, John, this is fantastic. You know, we got to have you over to, uh, you know, what you're saying. And, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I know that uh, yeah, you're really you're covering so much ground. Uh, you know, your talk also reminds me of a colleague from Rice, uh, Moshe Wardi, who was also, uh, you, you say, you perhaps have heard about his. Uh, talk and you know he's been very active in the ACM also sort of talk, he's not doing SLS but he's simply also been pushing a lot of the themes so you know I think that this well, so, no so you can find I mean there are domain experts uh -huh, uh -huh. in every one of these domains uh -huh. I can find domain experts who just work on bonobos or just work on um, the power grid or just work on fly brains 
And, they, and those people and those people know this already, right? I see, I see. But they don't. But but it's informal. It's kind of, um, it's it's kind of informal. It's ad hoc. Uh, so it's been exciting. Is when you, the the problem is, uh, the re, there are also resident theoreticians in all those fields. But you know, and and those research, and, uh, and this gets published. This gets published over their dead bodies. <laughs> but you know, I, I think a lot of people would love to hear about the SLS story, and then the. So I think we'll. Follow I'd be happy to do that. But I, the other thing we might think about is. Um, uh, so well, you already know a lot of the people who are. So if you want to think about you know machine learning in SLS, you've got. Ben Reck, you've got Nikolai Motney, yeah. you've got yeah. Sarah Dean, you know, you've got, you, you know, the people that are, they're experts in a way that I'm not. Um, what I'm, I would say I'm now maybe still the expert on is these sort of architectural issues about SLS, mm -hmm. not as interface with learning um, and not necessarily, you know, how it's being applied in every domain. So my students are much, so I have students who, know way more about the neuroscience than this, than I do, who know way more about, so the immune system part, the immune system stuff is maybe the most interesting thing I've seen so far. And I don't understand it at all. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, there, you know, there's, you know, after the, you know, the 20th cytokine, I'm lost. Um, and that's where you really need an architectural view because it's a little bit like, Imagine that you didn't know about state space. You just had scalars, everything. Um, even rudimentary control systems would just look like a uh, you know bowl of spaghetti. So you need you need architecture to make sense of this kind of complexity. Um, the problem, one of the big problems, though, is that when you say complexity or you say networks, um, it's not just that people don't think this way. They think as opposite from this as could be. So it's a little, I mean, this is a bad analogy maybe, but when you talk about evolution to a creationist, it's not that they think, you know, you're a little off. They think the earth is 5,000 years old. That's off by, you know, six orders of magnitude. It's not a little error. So this subject, the, this mainstream subject in science, complexity science, network science stuff is, it's like worse than neutrally wrong. It's like, it's very smart people who are more wrong than the creationists. So you're less wrong built thinking that God made everything five years and years ago than thinking that this is all at the edge of chaos or self-organized criticality or scale-free or whatever nonsense is the latest thing or rule 110 or whatever. I mean, there's all these different stories out there. So it's a huge obstacle. So getting this into the scientific community is very hard because there's gatekeepers who won't allow it. Um, now in neuroscience, the, the most important gatekeeper is already on my side. So this, hopefully I'm learning my lesson, uh, get them on your side before you start publishing. Fantastic. Well, that was a most thought provoking uh, lecture, John. Thank you very much for doing this. I think uh, we will follow up with you because I think you really, scratch the tip of the iceberg on a beautiful topic so we'll, uh, we'll yeah everything i said was i i one of the things i apologize is every single thing i said was incredibly superficial <laughs> um and uh you, you were covering and, and, a lot of area you were covering yeah so i went breadth instead of depth um and now so and here is so under the hood um it's what I can tell you about details is very uneven. Um, but I know people who can tell you enormous details about practically everything. So again, I, the, the immune system example is, is a case where I, I'm, I'm lost. Also, a lot of the neuroscience I don't really understand very well. Um, and, but we now have a conversation going between people who know SLS and know the immune system and know, you know, bacterial bios, you know, the microbiome. The other thing I didn't, I could have given the whole talk on the microbiome. The microbiome is amazing. And we really need all this machinery for the microbiome. Because um, you have thousands of species all interacting and it's just bewilderingly complex. And we can actually make sense of that if we can localize it. Because it is very local, very slow. 
uh, in, in the interaction and stuff. So, so it's very uneven in my head about how all the details underneath that I skipped over, but there are experts who now kind of can fill, we could fill in all these details. Um, but again, it's a huge enterprise. It's like I said, it's the, it's much bigger shift than anything I've ever seen in at least, you know, 45 years. Fantastic, but thank you very okay. much. Thank you, and Vee. And, and thank you for your patience in listening to this, what is essentially a rant. <laughs> Fantastic talk, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, bye-bye. Okay.